It's not a call to order, that's a salutation. Mr. Jordan, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, allow me on behalf of Mr. Mandela, who will be joining us shortly, and on the uh, behalf of the Nelson Mandela Foundation to welcome you all, and thank you for your presence here this morning. Today we are hosting two interrelated, though distinct, events. On the one hand, Mr. Kutrada and Richard Stengel are donating to the Foundation Center of Memory and Dialogue a priceless collection of sound recordings dating from the mid-1990s. At the same time, the Oppenheimer family is donating to the South African state a collection of Percy Utah's papers documenting the Ravonia trial of 1963-64. The sound recordings mark the end of a very long journey traveled by Mr. Mandela's autobiography, uh, Long Walk to Freedom. That work began in a close collaborative endeavor on Robben Island in 1975. It ended 20 years later when Mr. Katrada and Rick Stengel assisted Madiba to update and prepare the manuscript for publication. In the process, both men spent many hours in conversation with Madiba, pushing his memory and extending his analysis of historical events. And later, Sikatrada continued working with Madiba as they collaborated with Andrew Sampson on the uh, authorized biography. The result is a unique archive of Madiba's often very intimate engagement with his own memory. The significance of today is that for the first time this archive is being brought into the custody of an archival institution. And here at the Nelson Mandela Foundation, the tapes will be processed, digitized, transcribed, and ultimately made accessible to the public. This should be the destiny of all materials documenting the life and work and times of Nelson Mandela, wherever they are in the world, in whatever state, and in whoever's possession. They belong as a resource to the world in safe and professional custody. Secondly, today we will be witnessing the handover of the long itinerant prosecution records from the Ravonia trial. Recently, UNESCO acknowledged the importance in the world of the Ravonia trial archive by installing it on the UNESCO Memory of the World Register. And yet, the harsh reality is that much of the trial's official records is still missing. Despite the best endeavors of government and private investigators, we still don't know the full reach of this almost archetypal South African archival tale. But it is one of many, as the Truth and Reconciliation Commission documented so well in the latter stages of apartheid government, huge swaths of the official record were removed, hidden, or destroyed. The Percy Utah papers are a rich and invaluable part of South Africa's heritage. And today, the, the, the document, <coughs> the, or they document the prosecution's work in the Ravonia trial and include handwritten notes and a personal diary of Nelson Mandela. In the 1990s, the Oppenheimer family, in consultation with Madiba, purchased the papers from Percy Utah thus bringing them from willful personal custody into secure archival custody in the family's renter's uh, library. But ultimately, they belong with the rest of the state's Ravonia trial record in our national archives. And today, we witness the end of their long journey <coughs> home. So two very distinct events are joined by Madiba's intense personal interest in both and by the strong narrative theme common to both. So African archival heritage is coming home. Many people have worked hard over the years to make today's event <coughs> possible, and it is our hope that their efforts will be an example to many others who could facilitate rather than frustrate the coming home of our heritage. We begin formalities today with the Percy Utah papers, and it is my great pleasure and a thankful pleasure call the microphone to the open
States, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and distinguished guests, and especially those <coughs> who were the part of the proceedings of the Ravonio trial. It's a great pleasure for me to be standing here representing the Oppenheimer family, and later in the proceedings to be able to hand over uh, Percy Utah's papers to the National Archive. Jakes, as you rightly say, these are the, the Ravonia trial was a seminal trial in South Africa's history, involving all sorts of distinguished people, both in the dock and on the defensive team, and it was something that really changed, I believe, the world's perception of what was going on in South Africa and mobilized huge uh, support for the defendants and everything they stood for. The papers that my father managed to acquire, as you said, were those of the personal papers of Percy Utah, the chief prosecutor, relating to this trial. And uh, when my father heard at the time that these papers might be available for sale, he was absolutely determined that they should not leave South Africa. And he was able to negotiate with Percy Utah, and as you say, with the support and help of Nelson Mandela, to be able to acquire these papers. And they have, so to speak, been resting for a time in the Brenthurst Library, a great collection of Africana. And as soon as it became possible, my sister wrote to the uh, National Archive suggesting that it would be right and appropriate for these papers to reside in the National Archive with the writer, which is so important that they needed to be properly looked after and to be available for researchers to study and to work on in the years ahead. We have received all those necessary assurances and so from the family perspective, and it's really nice that my sister and members of her family are here with us today, we are really proud to be able to be passing these papers, which we've simply been custodian of for a short time, to the National Archive, and that we will shortly, in the presence of Nelson Mandela, hand them over, first of all, to the Minister for Onward Movement to the National Archive. We I'm pleased to be able to do this because this is part of South African history and part of history that needs to be available to all South Africans. Thank you. Thank you, Nikim. We can I now call on the Minister, Minister Jordan. Thank you, Professor Hello. Uh, Mr. Arthur Castleson, agricultural business. By the way, my judge, oh, sorry, <coughs> Your Honor, Judge Arthur Castleson, as George Bezos, uh, Mr. Dennis Goldberg, Kathy Catrada, Mr. Stengel, uh, Mrs. Mary Slack, Mr. Nikki Oppenheimer. Uh, there are lots of other people I suppose one should recognize who were in one way or another connected with the case. But to cover myself, I'll say all protocol observed, distinguished guests. This is a very significant moment as we move towards the end of 2008. Ninety years ago, in 1918, the father of our democracy, Nelson Folletra Mandela, was born. 45 years ago, 1963, on the 26th of November, to be precise, the Rivonia trial began. Ten years ago, the first jail president of our Democratic Republic, Nelson Mandela, received the first interim report of the Truth and Reconciliation Committee from uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu. So this is quite a significant month uh, in the annals of South African democracy. I wish therefore to commend the organizers of this event for bringing together so many of those who have an interest in these events. We have with us surviving trials and lawyers, 
historians and archivists, and we have also the Lilith Leaf Trust, as well as the Oppenheimer family. I'm also pleased to acknowledge Mr. Richard Stengel, editor of Time Magazine, who has also played an important part in the narrative of uh, Madiba's long walk to freedom. I also appreciate the presence here of representatives of UNESCO, which oversees the memory of the World Register, the record of humanity's universal archival and library heritage. The Rivonda trial was a seminal event in the struggle for freedom in this country. The leadership of the ANC and its military wing and the controversies were were rounded up by the security police in the Arade and Lillisleaf farm in Rivonia, which gave its name to the trial. Nelson Mandela was already in prison, having been arrested for leaving the country without a passport. His arrest had taken place a little earlier near Howick in the Midlands of Kwazulu Natal. And we have an exhibit here, one of the original warrants for his arrest. And we thank the Realistic Trust for having secured that water for the National Archives. Today, I wish to thank the Oppenheimer family, and especially the late Mr. Harry Oppenheimer, for their role in securing these records of the Revolia trial for the nation. Among the many mysteries attached to the Revolia trial is the fate of its documentation. The defense team were, we were told, very concerned that their offices and homes might be raided by the apartheid security police. And several members took steps to secure their records by depos depositing them with the South African Institute of Race Relations, who in turn deposited them with the historical papers collection at the University of Witwatersrand William Cullen Library, which is where they are to this day. Other records are out of the country, and some were squirreled away for protection in the United Kingdom and other countries. The prosecution team, headed by the Transvaal Attorney General, Dr. Percy Uta, collected and generated copious records. Firstly, the police gathered records and other items used as evidence in the trial. Uh, there is the famous Mandela diary, and secondly, the process of building and presenting the case and attacking the accused generated a vast legal record. In terms of the archival legislation enforced at the time, these records were public state-owned records and should have been transferred to the then state archives within 30 years of the conclusion of the case. When the archivists began making inquiries in 1993 and 94, the Department of Justice transferred what records it had. And it was immediately obvious that this was not a complete court record as required by law. It later transpired that former Attorney General Dr. Percy Uter had taken a somewhat elastic view of the notion of proper property, and many of the records were retained by him. <coughs> In the 1990s, he began to place these documents on the open market. Then President Mandela decided not to institute the prosecution of his former prosecutor, although I'm told the National Archives was very keen to do so. Mr. Harry Oppenheimer intervened and purchased the papers to prevent them from leaving the, leaving the country. They remained cared for at the Brentus Library until this morning. In the National Archives was the great Dr. Graham Dominic signed the instrument of agreement on behalf of the state, and the records are now being returned to the National Archives. I want to commend the Oppenheimer family for their public spiritedness and cooperation, and I hope that their example will serve to inspire other prominent South Africans, and others abroad for that matter, who also purchased the Volnia trial documents from the late Dr. Uto to return them to the National Archives as required by law. There is also an international dimension to this issue. South African government policy is to support the restitution of cultural property to its rightful owners. In this regard, our National Archives 
have returned material to Namibia and received materials from other countries. The, Re the Rivonia trial and the documents related thereto mark an internal restitution of which we are very proud. The UNESCO Memory of the World Committee also recognized the universal significance of the Rivonia trial records and has placed the body of records on the memory of the World Register, that is the archives and library equipment of World Heritage List for buildings and sites. I intend to mark this at another ceremony at the National Archives early next year, and I hope that by then, those persons still in possession of Rivonia trial papers will have followed the example of the Oppenheimers and returned them to the National Archives. This bringing together of the official collection marks the beginning of a process whereby we can properly catalog and conserve the whole collection in collaboration with other stakeholders such as the Brenton's Library, Lily Sleep Trust, Mandela Foundation, and the University of the Witwatersrand. One major need is to raise funds for the reformatting of the audio recording of the trial, which is still in its original and now inaccessible deep to belt format. As government, we are strongly committed to the preservation of an accurate record of our country's past, however painful particular episodes might be. <coughs> Humanity can only gain <coughs> by looking the past squarely in the face. We South Africans as the people will benefit immensely by a capacity to critically examine our past and learning from it. Once again, I want to thank in particular President Mandela, who will be gracing this occasion later with his presence. And our thanks go also to all the others who have honored us here with their presence. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Um, there may be a little bit of an interlude. We're waiting for Madiba now to uh, join us, and I'm afraid I'm not quite adept at entertaining you with jokes in the meantime. So you may mutually swap jokes until he arrives. Basis. All the original brick stand. Which one are you talking about? Both of them. Uh, I believe, and Rick may uh, correct me, I believe that the original that was on Robben Island and smuggled out was given to Rick uh, as a basis, but that was very tiny. Uh, but uh, Rick uh, has given that as a basis of what was written on Robben Island. I don't know where the actual physical original manuscript is, which was about 15 or 20,000 words that, um, I guess it was it Mac who smuggled it out. And um, because of all the changes in technology, everything that I had originally was on um, diskettes, which don't exist anymore. It's like eight track tapes. Uh, and that manuscript still exists and, and if I can, give an editorial comment, I, I think that should be published. That is, that is the great historical document. And, and of course, uh, you worked on that, you helped Mediba work on that in prison, and that really is an extraordinary document and, and, and very beautiful, actually. Um, I hope someday it will be published. And that did, in many ways, furnish the basis for, for a long walk to freedom in addition to the interviews that, that we did. So no, from just uh, our from point of view, uh, I happen to know a little bit about this because uh, my partner was involved in transcribing the original handwritten done by Lalu. Was it done by you, Yeah, by Lalu Chiba. She was responsible for 
transcribing that, uh, typing it. That manuscript, I think, uh, went back to Mount Maharaj, which then served probably for your, for your discs. But I think uh, somehow that has gone missing. No one knows where the typewritten manuscript went to. It got lost somewhere along the line. Uh, it might be worthwhile to track it down, uh, because again, it's very important. We started the dancing. I don't know exactly what happened to what you wrote, uh, but presumably, if that is extant somewhere, that's even more valuable than all these others. Yes. Because everything comes from you. As an artifact, it would be very valuable. In fact, Lalo and, and um, Mac would know, and Kathy would know. I, when During the course of our interviews, I asked <coughs> Uh, Mediva, how was it actually smuggled out of Robben Island? And this was 1992, 93 that I was asking him. And he would say, I cannot tell you that. There are still men in prison and they are still using this technique. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe these gentlemen here can explain because I, I would be. <laughs> you know the story. Yeah, may I? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, just a bit of background. The origin of Long Walk was on Robben Island in 1974. Uh, when Mac was going to be released in 1976. So the idea came when Walter Sisulu and I were walking and the idea came that we must make some sort of a political statement on Madiba's 60th birthday in 1978. And, and then we took the uh, suggestion to, to Madiba. He readily agreed uh, and he started writing and then there was a little editorial committee of uh, Medieval and myself and Walter. He gave the originals, his originals to us for our comments. We handed them back whether he rejected or accepted our comments, we don't know. But that was then given to Mac and, and Lalu Chiba here. They transcribed five or six hundred pages of Medivas writing to less than 50 pages. And uh, Mac was given the task because he was being released to smuggle that thing out. Chiba here had constructed from nothing what could be called an album. And in the uh, covers of the album, he concealed uh, the transcripts. But Mac and Chiba had, uh, uh, mainly Mac rather, had written, uh, transcribed uh, the thing, the Madiba's original. Uh, Mac then transported it safely from Robben Island to Cape Town, from Cape Town elsewhere, transported it to Durban, had it transported it to London. And I have it on good authority that when the first government was announced by Madiba, uh, Madiba made Mac the Minister of Transport. <laughs> Thanks very much. That was actually quite an enlightening rather than an amusing interlude. Thank you very much. Mr. Mandela is about to arrive and to join us. Can we ask the people to switch off their cell phones apparently it's interfering with some of the technology here? I told you rather remain seated for the sake of the television cameras in the back.
Well, welcome. We, uh, we gathered here and we've had some uh, speeches already, but we gathered here for the presentation of the Ramonia trial records over to the State Archives and also uh, sound recordings of uh, interviews with Kathy and Rick with yourself to be handed over to the Foundation. Welcome. Right, can I now call upon uh, Nikki Oppenheimer and Minister Jordan for the presentation, the formal presentation of the Ramonia trial record from Brenters to the National Archives. <laughs> and I hope everybody can hear. It's a great pleasure to hand over the Ramonia papers that presided with the uh, Chief Prosecutor. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that these will now be transferred to the National Archives. And uh, Mediva, we want to thank you for your help in this process and your support in this process as well. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Oppenheimer and Mr. Jordan. And this now brings us in, uh, kind of speaking to the second part of the dual events that we're celebrating today. That's the, in regard to the sound recordings that will come to the uh, Nelson Mandela Foundation and its Center of Memory. And I now call upon first Rick Stengel and then Mr. Catrada to say a few words. And you can remain sitting there if you prefer. Thank you very, very much. I'm delighted to be here and honored to be with you, Mediva, again. Uh, we've been a little bit informal this morning, so I want to tell the story of how I came down to work on Long Walk to Freedom uh, with Mr. Mandela. I came down in um, December of 1992, and it was a very busy time then. It was before the election. It was a perilous time in South Africa. And I spent several weeks waiting to see President Mandela. And when I finally got in to see him to explain what the project was, we had a very nice and brief conversation, at the end of which Mediva said to me, I assume we can do this one or two more times and we will have enough for the book. <laughs> so I said, if you think we'll have enough for the book after two or three sessions like this, you are crazy. At which point Barbara Masakela walked into the office and escorted me out, and I thought the project was over right there. <laughs> many, many hours later, 70 hours of tapes later, and, and months later, where I just affixed myself to Mediva and wouldn't leave, we had enough material for what is one of the greatest books, I believe, in the history of civilization. There's a great 19th century philosopher who said, who asked the question, does history make the man, or does the man make history? And whenever I asked Mediba a question like that, he would look at me with a kind of curious glance and say, Richard, why not both? <laughs> and of course, the answer is, it is always both. 
history made the circumstances to create a man like Nelson Mandela, and then Nelson Mandela grasped history by the lapels and changed it. And because of his life, because of his courage, because of his humanity, the history of the 20th century was changed, and I believe the history of the 21st century has changed. In, in my country, we now have a, a newly elected president, Barack Obama. I believe that Nelson Mandela paved the way for Barack Obama. It is the greatest privilege of my life to have worked with Madiba on Long Walk to Freedom. Uh, it was a privilege to be in his country, his, in his company. Uh, I missed him terribly when, when it was all over. Uh, I had one consolation, which is that I met my wife, Mary Pfaff, while I was working on the project, and Mediva always said, you must marry her. <laughs> and except for when I told him he was crazy in that first meeting, I never contradicted him thereafter. Uh, my mother-in-law is here today, and Long Walk to Freedom is a book that will be read for as long as people throughout history believe in justice, believe in humanity, believe in kindness, believe in fairness, and, and that is forever. And I thank you for the privilege of letting me work with you on that. to just introduce the uh, the tapes uh, but before doing that I think on behalf of the three one two three three Rogonia trialists I should uh, thank uh, George and Arthur here uh, I always say that they sent us to jail but uh, I have to remind I'm always reminded that they also saved our lives so thank you for being here now about the tapes uh, between uh, Rick and myself, there were 100 hours of tape. Uh, we're not going to play the 100 hours today. <laughs> we are choosing just some extracts, five extracts, which will be played here. The four of them relate to what had happened is that after Rick had, uh, had taped his part of it, uh, I was given the manuscript. Uh, and my con conversations with Mediba was about the manuscript. If there were any amendments he wanted to make, any faults he wanted to find, etc. Because Mediba is very meticulous uh, about commas and exclamation marks and so forth. So that took uh, 40 hours between the two of us. So the four, the first four extracts that you're going to hear in a little while relate to Mediba's underground days. Uh, when Mediba was underground, he. Uh, we were a group of people who had to find safe houses for him, safe transport, etc., etc. So he's recalling that uh, some incidents of uh, of those uh, uh, of those years of the underground years. And the fifth uh, uh, extract is not from his underground days, but he's recalling something more recent than that. Uh, I should say, because fortunately. Madiba always has the last word, and today we have the last word. So uh, he won't have a chance to reply. Somewhere in the tape, we are talking about Madiba's beard. Now, when he was underground, we who were in this little group looking after his underground uh, movement insisted that he should shave off his beard. Because he was well known throughout South Africa, through papers and so forth, and he had to be disguised but Madiba refused to shave. Uh, some people have described it, he himself has described it as something else. I described it, uh, and I'm not re revealing any secrets, in an article I wrote on his 80th birthday, I said that was vanity. <laughs> anyway, without much ado, uh, the, there are two tapes referring to Frididov, because we also had uh, safe houses in Frididov. Now, what had happened is that, just to clarify a bit, uh, Malvi Kachalia, who was Secretary of the Transvaal Indian Congress, had found these two houses for us. He spoke to the head of the household, and I must be very politically correct, head of the household was a male, but he forgot to tell the female, the, the household executive. 
So when Madiba turned up there, this heaven in an overall, and uh, she asked, who are you? So Madiba said, Modi Kachalia has sent me. She did, I don't know you, and closed the door. <laughs> On the second occasion, uh, they did allow him in at another house in Trujillo, and the child came and says, my mother is very scared, when are you leaving? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I thought it was a better little introduction. Uh, we're ready to listen to the tape. There are two cases. Cases by me when I attended meetings in Foster and I saw Turok and others on one occasion during the day. And uh, more than went to a family in Foster, three of three of them, that's right. Yeah. And said, uh, look, uh, somebody's going to come and stay here tonight. Uh, could you accommodate him? They agreed to very enthusiastically because they respected the money. Now, I was wearing an overall, and they very often they said, didn't comb my hair. And I went to this house, you know, just to do the word of the house. You know, they gave me the address, and to tell them that I would come back in the evening. I knocked. And the lady came from over the door. She said, yes, what do you want? I said, the one, my mom, the Katana, has arranged that I should stay here. And she says, I have no room for you. Bang the door. <laughs> because she saw this wild fellow, you know? Yeah. Now, the, the second next. Ex- I don't know if I mentioned this one in the morning. Huh? When you were shooting this? No, no not the, the, the one where I was shooting a bird. Yeah. <coughs> but the chaps were building <coughs> Africans from Alexander. Mm-hmm. Uh, what happened, they say, was that um, as they were building, putting up buildings, uh, <coughs> uh, then I would make tea for them. Don't prefer to pretend to, to, uh, to be a chef and make tea for them. And one day, you see, I called them to come and have tea in the kitchen. And they sat down <coughs> and I had a tray and uh, a sugar plant over the bowl. And I gave the tea to a fellow. First fellow, and he took a cup of tea. I was telling a story, and then uh, he took uh, uh, sugar and put it in. And then the second one, because he was concentrating on the story, he did not actually reach uh, the bowl. And uh, I stood there for some time, and then I moved away to the second chair. And he says, Wait up! <laughs> And I came back, you see, and I uh, got his sugar, you see. But they treated me very contemptuously, you know. Ah. Wait up! <laughs> well, you have to mention that one. Yeah. That's a good one. <laughs>